Hi, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Marshall. Welcome to Tumble, the show where we explore stories of science discovery. Today, we're talking about bird songs. Are we talking about songs about birds or songs that birds sing that are probably also about birds? <laughs> songs by birds. So get ready for the musical stylings of our feathered friends. Because have you ever wondered what bird you're hearing outside? We're going to find out how to recognize birds by their sound and what that means for science. Ooh, where are we? I'm hearing like a lot of birds around us. We're going birding. Ooh, I love birding. Is that a chickadee? Right now, what you're hearing might sound like a lot of random bird noises. But by the end of this episode, you'll know a way to recognize individual birds by their songs. Seriously? That sounds cool. Yeah, so let's meet our guide. My name is Trevor Attenberg. Trevor is a birder, also known as a bird watcher. He's an environmental scientist and science communicator. And he studied how birds interact with different environments, from cities to forests and everywhere in between. There are birds all around us. We don't even need to have binoculars to see them. They tell us about where we are and they give us a sense of place. He sounds like a very uh, meditative bird guy. <laughs> yeah, I just want to close my eyes and listen to him talk about birds. You should uh, maybe not close your eyes because we're not done recording yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe our listeners can do that. So let's close our eyes <laughs> as Trevor tells us about the first time he tuned in to bird songs. It was April. It was probably like one of the first warm spring days. It was with some folks from my school. It was on a weekend, and it was in the morning. We were clearing these uh, invasive plants. Trevor was a teenager living in a rural area of Connecticut on the east coast of the U.S. He'd grown up exploring the woods, and he'd always been curious about nature. But something was about to happen that would set the direction for his life. That was a big, the big day, a big moment of, of excitement and uh, revelation to me. Well, so what happened? While he was clearing up the plants, he heard something. And I heard uh, this one solitary bird kind of singing from uh, this deep valley where kind of a fast-flowing stream cut through. I already knew what it was. I might have just, like, mentioned it offhand, like, oh, there's a, I think that's a Louisiana water thrush. And maybe somebody said, like, oh, oh, yeah? <laughs> you know? um, so I just, like, I kept it inside, and, uh, but I was, I, had, I probably had a big smile on my face at that time. And listen, I'm, I'm sure I wanted to stop and listen and, and get closer and just, like, okay, let's hear that again. Let's, let's wait for it to sing again. Trevor was hooked. Hearing that song and recognizing that bird may have seemed like serendipity, like a lucky moment. But for Trevor, that moment was payoff for years of hard work. Really? How so? Just like hearing a bird? He found his own way to study and recognize birds. And the story of how he did that shows that you don't need to see birds to be a bird watcher. I was born with the condition that would cause me to lose my vision. I lost my, most of my vision pretty early on in my life, but it was actually a facial deformity that caused it, something that affected the way my bones and my face grew. That damaged my optic nerves. Trevor's blindness didn't stop him from spending a lot of time outdoors as a kid. There were worms in the dirt that I could dig up, and I did. He picked up knowledge about plants and animals from friends and family. Maybe it's you know, me as a blind person fearing that I am missing out on stuff. I just have this desire to know what's around to me. Trevor wanted to know more. He wanted to be an expert. I didn't really get to be that way about nature, and I didn't really start that journey until I was a teenager. So what set Trevor on his journey? Like, how did he get to that wooded stream recognizing birds by ear? And how can we learn to do it, too? We'll find out when we come back from this quick break. Okay. 
Okay, so when we left off, Trevor was preparing to start his journey to become an expert about nature, and he began with a set of bird recordings. My first encounter with bird recordings actually came from a CD-ROM I had. Um, this is get, getting back into the Stone Age a little bit here. There was an encyclopedia that came on a disc with every copy of a computer system in the 90s, which is like way back in the day. This has got to be really alien for our kids. <laughs> <laughs> like there used to be a time when everything you wanted wasn't just at your fingertips on the internet. You had to have a CD with that stuff on it. And before that, there were books. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. So Trevor got the CD on his family computer and he started playing around with it. So there were articles on the CD-ROM for each individual U.S. state. There was a picture and a recording of each state bird. So I went through each state and memorized each of the state birds. Wow, so you just like listened to the state bird recordings over and over? Yes, and as a result, he has an encyclopedic knowledge of state birds. So Connecticut, where I grew up, our state bird is the robin. Compare that to they had recordings of uh, the eastern bluebird from New York. Or the western meadowlark, which is the state bird of Oregon and, and many other states. Listening to these recordings, Trevor dreamed of hearing these birds sing live. I didn't necessarily know if they lived in Connecticut or not, but I remember going out and trying to hear them outside and thinking, like, how great would that be? So it's like uh, finally getting those tickets to Fleetwood Mac. <laughs> or Taylor Swift. Or Billie Eilish. <laughs> or <laughs> the Louisiana water thrush. Exactly. Trevor took his bird fandom to the next level when he got the box set a CD of 500 birds of North America. Each track had a different bird recording. Wow, that's, that's a lot of bird songs to memorize. I mean, it's all the hits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to handle just the pure volume of bird songs, he started to break down the birds into groups. He found each group had their own type of song. I became quite interested in how different groupings of birds, like, say, the warblers and the thrushes and the sparrows. They tended to have specific qualities of their sounds that sort of would group them together. Huh. So it's like how, like, pop music is different from rock, which is different from hip-hop, which is different from uh, country, rap, or so on. <laughs> different from Gregorian chants. Yes. <laughs> Your favorite genre. <laughs> which bird species does Gregorian chant? <laughs> A lot of the blackbirds, the birds we call blackbirds, they tend to make these chipping sounds, especially when they fly. They chip, chip, chip. And that was really handy. Okay, so I'll go outside and I'll listen for these uh, chipping sounds and maybe it'd be one of these blackbirds. Okay, so he'd listen for like the chip chip songs and then he'd narrow it down to what blackbird it was. Exactly. Eventually, Trevor focused in on the birds that lived in his home state of Connecticut. Through his research, he learned there were over 300 species of birds that he might hear. I was impressed by that. I was like, who knows this? I didn't know this. Nobody knows this. Now I know it. And I'm going to find out where these birds live and, and maybe they live around me. So I'm starting to see where this is going. Yes, we're going back to that warm, early spring morning in a wooded forest where Trevor encountered the Louisiana water thrush. I knew by that time it was a possibility. It was something to listen for. When Trevor heard the water thrush song, his long hours of learning on his computer had finally paid off. He had known something about his environment that the people around him didn't. He felt proud, and he was entranced by what he heard. I was, I was riveted. 
that's what I I remember, and that's how I am, and that's how I how I behave to this day. Well, that's so cool. So Trevor did make it to the bird concert. Totally. <laughs> He'd gained entrance to what felt like a secret world, and he'd found his own way there. So how do we get into this secret bird world? Trevor has some tips for getting those exclusive tickets. (laughs) (laughs) Get a map, get a checklist of popular birds just to start off with. Like you, you see a list of maybe 10, 20 common birds. Okay, like go out and find those. Okay, so you get a local list of all the most common birds around you and when they're touring. (laughs) Then look them up. It's much easier to find recordings and information on the internet than it was when Trevor was getting started. Yeah, I've heard some pretty great bird recordings online. Yeah, once you've tuned your ears to those songs of common local birds, listen for their songs when you go outside or listen out your window you might find that these songs already sound familiar to you. That's what happened to me when I heard this recording. Oh, wow, that's that's like a ton of birds. It's a recording Trevor made in the town where he grew up. And I realized that I had heard these birds too because I grew up not far from there. But I never really thought about what I was hearing. So I asked Trevor to explain what's in the recording. It's hard to miss the wood thrush when you hear it. So this isn't the water thrush we heard before. This is the wood thrush, which is a completely different element. (laughs) Yes. The wood thrush is the the one that's really up front. Uh, That's the one we're hearing the most. If I can try to whistle the the melody, it's sort of a... (whistles) Kind of like that. But it typically goes through like a, a few different varieties of its song each time it sings. Man, he really nailed that whistle. It's almost like he's been practicing. (laughs) Bird calls really do start to sound like songs or words, if you listen closely. In this uh, recording, we have an oven bird, which is a very, quite, quite different sound. That's what they call him the teacher bird, saying, teacher, 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 teacher. You hear that kind of up, down, up, down, up, down pattern in the background. Shouldn't it be called a student bird if it's annoyingly calling for its teacher? (laughs) Well, maybe it's just a teacher that's proud of being an educator. (laughs) I'm a teacher, 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 teacher. (laughs) But as you learn the birds in your own area, you can start to get a sense of how they're unique and pick them out of a crowd. Well, that's cool. It would definitely take like a lot of time and patience, but... It does seem like anyone could learn to bird by ear. Let's actually take a moment to stop and see if we can tune into the bird world right now. Listeners, you can pause the podcast to listen where you are. I think I hear a uh, black-capped chickadee, uh, maybe a morning dove doing its morning morning. Marshall, you're like already a bird enthusiast. <laughs> I mean, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how you didn't know this already. <laughs> And listeners, if you were just listening to birds, you might have heard way more birds than you'll be able to see if you had been standing outside looking for them. That's what Trevor learned when he decided to study birds in his university. It's true that I cannot see birds in the field, at least not usually. I'm not going to be able to spot birds through binoculars or something like that. But that's okay because, especially if you're going through the forest... 90 plus percent of your encounters with birds are going to be purely auditory. Wow. So that means that 90 percent of the time you're just hearing them. So for every one bird you see, you hear nine. Trevor found this out for himself when he went to a national park in Costa Rica to collect data on birds. That involves being able to identify what birds are there in the forest. Trevor found just as many birds as the sighted students he was with. And so I was, in that sense, on equal footing with the others that I was doing this research with. So that was really invigorating and built my confidence a lot. It's kind of wonderful how much information you can get about birds just from listening to their call. Yeah, and for Trevor, it meant that bird songs didn't just have to be a fun hobby anymore. Though they're a really fun hobby. (laughs) Birds became a tool for contributing to science. 
think scientific investigation is a matter of putting your curiosity and putting your knowledge base into good use. In a few years after his trip to Costa Rica, Trevor builds on the experience by setting up his own experiment. He counted the birds that he could hear in a city park. I wanted to compare that data, the data that I collected, from that collected by some sighted birders, purely through sight. He compared the number of birds found by sighted birders to what he found. And how did it turn out? In terms of birds that were detected by individuals, like a sighted person versus a me, a blind person, there's not a big difference. So that seems pretty clear. Like, you don't need binoculars or even really to be able to see in order to find a lot of cool birds. For Trevor, birds gave him a place in science. Well, they gave me the sense that I could be a scientist. They also told me that other people could be scientists, that it's not, it's not as exclusive a realm as we're sometimes led to believe. It means that truly anyone can be a birder and anyone can access the bird world, whether it's for science or just to enjoy. That really changes how people might think about birds, because you always just imagine birders with binoculars and only seeing bright colors and stuff. But there's so much more that's interesting about how they sound. Yes, and for Trevor, this realization truly expanded his world. For me, certainly, it opened up a new dimension of reality to understand that there was this soundscape around me that I was not aware of previously. It just broadened my, my existence completely. Today, Trevor works on accessible technology, and he loves to write about birding and teach other blind people to bird. He's also lived and traveled all over the world. But no matter where he is, birds keep him grounded. It's still something that brings me immense happiness and pleasure. And it makes me feel like I'm at home wherever I am to be able to know what kind of birds are around. Now that you've learned Trevor's method for learning bird songs and recognizing birds, try it for yourself. Get a list of the most common birds in your area. Look up their songs and then listen for them outside. And if you like that, take it to the next level. There's plenty of great citizen science projects where you can help gather information about birds that will help scientists learn more about the environment. We'll have all that information on our website, so try it out you may be surprised with all the birds you can find. Thanks today to Trevor Attenberg. You can learn more about Trevor on the bonus interview episode on our Patreon at patreon.com slash tumblepodcast. And we'll have more free resources to learn about citizen science projects, local bird lists, and accessible birding available on the blog on our website, sciencepodcastforkids.com. This material is based upon work supported by the National Science Foundation under grant number 2148711, Engaging Blind, Visually Impaired, and Sighted Students in STEM with Storytelling Through Podcasts. Special thanks to the team who helped us with this episode, Dr. Peter Walters, Dr. Carrie Sapalo, Ashley Nybert, and the team at Independent Science. Also thanks to Dr. Kelly Reidinger and Dr. Martin Storksteek at Oregon State University's STEM Research Center, and Dr. Timothy Spock at AUI. Sarah Robertson Lentz edited this show and designed the episode art. Peter Walters is our editorial consultant for this series. Elliot Hajaj is our production assistant, and Gary Calhoun James engineered and mixed this episode. I'm Lindsay Patterson, and I wrote this episode. I'm Marshall Escamilla, and I made all the music and sound design for this episode. Tumble is a production of Tumble Media. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for more stories of science discovery. Discovery.